Uh, this whole thing's very interesting, and uh, we, um, it's this whole thing of when you get down to the reality of how these truths affect our lives. It's uh, when a wrong has been done, the one to whom the wrong has been done really needs grace to forgive, because it's not easy, and the one who has done the wrong needs humility to make amends. So without grace and humility, it didn't work. Now, another little guy who was uh, a victim was our Charlie. So we need to make amends. You might get a share if you talk nice to your brother. <laughs> Tell me if he doesn't share with you. I think for all of us, the, the quality of our humanity and the authenticity of our spirituality are most brutally exposed in the arena where truth and justice and mercy and forgiveness are the challenge we face. I think there's a lot of um, hypocrisy, both inside and outside church. I think while things are easy, any of us can be posers, promoting ourselves to be something that potentially we are not because... To the degree that we produce that behavior is usually in situations that it's kind of not that difficult to do what we do. But when we get to the nitty-gritty of what changes our world, it's not those things that change our world. And the truth is, it's not those things that heal our relationships or, or, or fix our own heart. And um, I thought that slide was great, you know, that I never knew how strong I was until I had to forgive someone who wasn't sorry and accept an apology I never received. How many of you have ever accepted an apology you never received? See, see at the root of our humanity and, and the root of our spirituality, the, these are the kind of things we have to get to grips with if we're going to be the kind of victorious people in life who make a difference for others. I, I, I thought the, um, you know, the clip of, again, Jean Valjean in... Um, uh, in, in Les Miserables, or as we say in Yorkshire, Les Miserables. Um, the truth is he was stealing in the face of kindness. Because the bishop has actually been really kind. John Valjean was on the run. And, you know, the reason we use some of these parables is because we've all been there. We've all been on the run from something. We've all been a fugitive to some to some accusation. We've all been the victims trying to escape a guilt. And, um, and we finish up in situations which are not that exact situation, but have some similarities. And, and what struck me about, uh, about John Valjean was in spite of the, the kindness of the bishop, he was willing to steal in the face of kindness. And uh, you need to wake up in life because very often that happens to all of us. You can be kind, you can be trying to be kind, you can try to serve others, and someone will steal in the face of your kindness, being obsessed with their own needs. And of course, the question is, what should be the response to being stolen from? And that's when really the rubber begins to hit the road, because we're all fine and dandy until we believe somebody stole from us. You stole my reputation. You stole my peace. You stole my confidence. You know, you, 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 you stole, my, you stole my, my bravery, you stole whatever, you stole my name. What should be the response to being stolen from? So I like the fact that he, he said, not only let him have the silver, but let him have the candlesticks as well. Now, there's one ethical thing in here, which I'm being really quick on this. Did the bishop lie? Because when the guy came who'd arrested Jean Valjean, he said, he said you gave it to him. But you saw at the beginning that, in essence, the bishop didn't give it to him because he, he, he knocked the bishop out and he took it from him. So did the bishop lie? Or can I put something else? Was his heart in that moment so towards stopping a, st stopping a cycle of wrong that it went from holding and withholding to giving and letting go? So, so in his heart, he was not stolen from something had changed in him and so now the bishop wasn't lying even though it looked as though he was lying because something had changed in the bishop's heart when something changes in your heart the circumstance of the situation will change and how you respond will change was he in that moment breaking a cycle 
that would ultimately prove destructive to both parties. So let me finish this bit. Just I'll come back and say a few words in, the, in another few minutes. But when he said to him, he looked him in the eye, he said, and now I give you back to God. That's a lovely statement, but it should be a statement of grace, not an expression of, answer, uh, of anger. See, most often when we do that, I'm leaving this in the hands of God. It's not an expression of grace. I mean, be honest, I'm just leaving this with the Lord. I'm going to put you in God's hands. It's very rarely an expression of grace. Usually it's an expression of anger because our perception is that God still deals in retributive justice. And if you think it's bad upsetting me, you've also upset God and woe betide you because, you know, I'm leaving you in God's hands. Well, I think now I give you back to God is a statement of grace. And I would right now where I am in my life happily say that to you and I hope that you could happily in grace be able to say that to me knowing that there is a force, a power, a presence in the God who we now are beginning to understand whose grace reaches to us and turns what would have been our theft in the face of kindness to a gift to allow our lives to become free and released to become all that we should become. I have this uh, weird idiosyncrasy that... um, works in me, which is that I don't always like to see a movie twice, because something inside me, if I watch it again, wants the end to be different to the last time I watched it. So I love Braveheart, but, but I can't keep watching it because I'm so desperate that at the end, William Wallace doesn't get taken to London, and he doesn't get hung, drawn, and quartered, but you have a different outcome. Now, that might sound stupid, but whenever I see a movie and people say, shall we watch it? It's like, I only want to watch it if the end's different, which, of course, can't be the case because that's a movie. However, in our own lives, in that that runs as the film of our own life, the truth is we are not stuck in that same area. I can't change the end of a movie, but I can change the end of my life. I can change the end of my story. I can affect the outcome. And the reason we do all this really is to say there does not have to be a fixed outcome to what it is that has formed the elements of this story. Maybe in this story, William Wallace does escape and he doesn't get hung, drawn and quartered. Maybe you do get healed. Maybe your relationship does get restored. Maybe your heart does find peace because this is not the end of the story. I think Jesus spoke some wide words, wise words on this matter and they're found in Luke chapter 6. Just listen to this. I wanted to read these to you. They'll be familiar, but when they become practical in, in a context like this, it's a bit more difficult. Here's what he said. But I tell you who hear me, love your enemies. Do good to those who hate you. Bless those who curse you. Pray for those who mistreat you. If someone strikes you on one cheek, turn to him the other also. If someone takes your cloak, don't stop him from taking your tunic. Give to everyone who asks of you, and if anyone takes what belongs to you, don't demand it back. Do to others as you would have them do to you. This is the proper application of that that statement. I love this now, get this. If you love those who love you... What credit is that to you? Even sinners love those who love them. If you do good to those who are good to you, what credit is that to you? Even sinners do that. And if you lend to those from whom you expect repayment, what credit is that to you? Even sinners lend to sinners expecting to be repaid in full. But love your enemies, do good to them, And lend to them without expecting to get anything back. Then your reward will be great, and you will be sons of the Most High, because he is kind to the ungrateful and wicked. I love this. You expect him to say, because he's kind to the grateful and righteous. Because it's like, well, we just did the stuff that we didn't feel like doing. And that was opposite to what we felt we ought to do. And you think, so Jesus would say... Uh, uh, that uh, um, uh, then your reward will be great. You'll be sons of the Most High because he is kind to the grateful and the righteous. But he says, no, it'll work because he's kindful to the ungrateful and the wicked. What you're releasing is something into the situation that is powerful and amazing and beyond what you can see. And it says, be merciful just as your Father 
is merciful. I think this clip that we saw with Fantine, the lady, and Jean Valjean is a wonderful example of that. That John was making recompense, he was making amends for a wrong that he had done to Fantine, and now he's trying to fix it by realizing that, that if somebody doesn't break the cycle, all the rules will ever do is put people in prison will separate those who need to be healed and brought back together. It will separate you because one of them's in prison and one of them isn't. But then you're in the prison of your own guilt while they're in the prison of their actions and nothing ever gets healed and nothing gets fixed. Now, I love when Jean Valjean says, let her go. Uh, you watch the movie and think, yeah, let her go. But I wonder how many people you let go who you think have wounded you and should make offence. I wonder whether they're more likely to be on the kill list from the beginning. And you're waiting just to strike them off the kill list, but only if you get what you're looking for, only if you get what you want. See, letting something go, letting a person go, is actually hard. I'm giving you that. It's hard. I'm not studying here saying, just do it. And the question would be, why would you want to let her go? She spat in his face, is what Javert said. You know, she'd, she'd punched the guy on the street. She, you know, lots of things that were going on. The way she'd behave when she worked for Jean Valjean. Why would you want to? Because the way to healing is when you let him go, you let her go, you let it go. And we are very poor at doing that. We actually feel payment must be made before we're prepared to let someone go. I love the fact that the bishop basically said, I'm giving you this, I'm giving you the price of your own redemption. I'm giving you the silver. Like God giving to us what it is that we need when we should actually be paying back. He's giving to us so that we have what we need to deal with what we face. It starts with condemnation and judgment and a call for justice. But what I love is that it ends sat at the table. Jean Valjean and Fantine end sat at the table together. Question tonight is, do you want to stop the cycle? For all of us, we have a cycle in this. We've we got history, we've got a past, we've got record on this. Do you want to stop the cycle? Let me give you one last little story, just, just for a couple of minutes. There's an old, old ancient story in, in the Bible, in the second book of Samuel, about the king of Israel at that time, David, who, um, although he was the king, before he became the king, there was another king called Saul, who chased David down. He was, David became a fugitive. Saul was trying to kill him, but David became best friends with Saul's son, okay? And so his best friend's dad's trying to kill him, hates him, spreading bad stories about him, after him all the time. But when it comes to the crunch, his best friend sides with his own dad, and David is left having lost his friend, and the mentor, and the king who was ruler, and in that situation he becomes king, but then he feels sad about it to the extent where he feels that even though an injustice has been done to him, he wants to fix that injustice by being gracious. And so he asks this question, is there anybody left of Saul's household that I can show kindness to? And there's a guy called Mephibosheth who was the son of Jonathan. Now, Here's, here's the sad thing. Mephibosheth was disabled. Mephibosheth had been damaged when his nurse was running from the occupying army in the time of his father, and she dropped him, and he became disabled. Either a quadriplegic or a paraplegic, but he was disabled. He was unable to walk from that time. So, you know, you can imagine Mephibosheth's situation. He, he carried the wounds of someone else dropping him. He carried the wounds of a situation over which he had no control. He carried the wounds of a father that was lost because there was a battle and, and then a guy who becomes king instead of his own dad, so he now doesn't have his position. All the stuff that we see as unjust in our life, the situations, what, how we've been dropped, how we've been let down, how we've been betrayed... And now he feels out of it, but David sends for him. And uh, he brings him to what is basically the king's court. But here's what I think is wonderful. He specifically invites him to sit at the king's table. 
And the wonderful thing is that although Mephibosheth had all his wounds and his disabilities, there's something wonderful that when you sit at the table, we all look the same. So when Mephibosheth was invited to come graciously sit at the king's table, it meant we all look the same. Somehow what gets lost in that moment at the table is our differences and our anxieties and our aggravations because we all look the same and we're all sat at the same level. It doesn't matter how tall we are, how big we are, whatever we are, we all look the same and then we begin to share of the same meal, just like Jean Valjean and just like Fantine. That's what restorative justice and making amends looks like. When we sit at the same table together, we all look the same. And the wounds and the pains and the difficulties and the differences are no longer what is visible. So I wanted to end by saying this. I truly see this reflected in the message and work of Christ. In that he does not ask us to hang on a cross but to sit at a table. The cross was his. The table is ours. Because that's where we all look the same. We're invited to something. And I believe just like Jean Valjean and Fantine at that table marked a point at which they had a healing and they'd come together. I believe the same has happened. I find it interesting that The command that Jesus left behind was not, you all need to get crucified if you're with me. He said, here's what I want you to do. I want you to sit at the table that we call the Lord's table. I want you to celebrate that the cross was mine, but the table is yours. And today, if we're willing, the cross is his, but the table is ours. We can choose to sit at that table. We can choose in that grace to come where we all look the same. And in the partaking of that peace together... We become one and we become healed. So a couple of things I want to do. One is, on Wednesday night, um, we we will have um, uh, Engage, where people will share their story. But in that Engage, we will make time where we sit at the table and we have bread and we have wine to make a declaration that all that stuff that has been in me the reason for a need for justice and unforgiveness that's become my wounds. The amends are made when we partake of that cross that is grace and his life and his forgiveness that we let flow to others. I'll probably ask you to do something else as well, which is to write on a piece of paper where those unforgivenesses are, where those pains are, where those injustices are, and then leave that at the table when you go because that's where it should stay. So, what's in your heart? What do you want to release? Are you prepared to release? In your situation, are you prepared to let him go, let her go, let it go? And are you prepared to let him, her, it go with not just the silverware but also the candlesticks? Because somehow in the giving, there is a receiving. Somehow in the letting go, there is a peace that fills that void. But we need to do the letting go. So I want to pray right now. Maybe you in your heart have got some faces you see. Maybe you're like the guy who was called, who had his kill list. Maybe there's still those people in there that you think, if only, if only, if only... But I believe there is a grace to help us deal with that. So I just want to pray right now. If you've got somebody on your heart, just pray in your heart. I'll let it go. I'll let him go. I'll let her go. I'll let this go. And give grace to it. Give peace to it. I believe if you choose to let it go, then you'll find that what comes in to fill that void will be a grace that will free you and release you from the prison that that would take you into. So Lord, I pray tonight that your grace will surround every heart every life. Your peace will be present with us today as we let go him, her, it, that situation that for us we have required justice. And as we help us as well, if, we, if we've been the offending party to be willing to make amends, to give of ourselves so that in giving of ourselves there might be a full healing within, within, within the depths of our heart and in the depths of our soul. In Jesus' name, amen.